Shana Tova, everybody. I'll invite you all now, and I'll give you a moment to think about it. But I'll invite you to close your eyes and think about the last time you experienced joy. I was at a dinner table recently where someone posed this question. I considered how I experience joy while I'm watching my dog romp around the dog park, or I thought back to the last time I laughed so hard that I had trouble breathing. I felt joy on November 14th, 2021, when my husband Daniel and I got married. (laughs) Or more recently, I experienced joy when I attended the Taylor Swift concert. (laughs) Joy is not uplifted as an important value in American society, particularly in our post-pandemic world. That being said, I suspect that if we were kinder to ourselves and we allowed ourselves to notice and relish joy when it happens for us, then our lives and the entire world would be better. What do I mean by joy? People often conflate happiness and joy, but the two are different. The writer J.D. Salinger once wrote, happiness is a solid, but joy is a liquid. Joy is not the temporary, ego-gratifying burst of happiness when you, oh, I don't know, get a, find a $20 bill in your pocket or you taste a really good bite of dark chocolate. No. Joy, joy is the deep and lasting. It really comes from your soul. It's this feeling of optimism and satisfaction. It arises in us despite or perhaps alongside awareness of the world's pain. Joy is the recognition that we are a part of something something larger than ourselves. Joy enables us to be agents in creating a kinder world. I think some people feel irresponsible for feeling joy amidst so much heartbreak in our world. To this I say, joy is an act of resistance. Perhaps some of you heard about or participated in this past summer of Barbenheimer, Taylor Swift, and Beyonce. For the first time in a while, masses of people showed up to embrace things usually considered frivolous. Things like pink and sparkles and pop music and of course Barbie. This is no coincidence. It resonated with a society in desperate need of joy. In a recent article titled Barbie Taylor Beyonce and the Era of Joy, author Jen Wilde reflects, this cultural phenomenon we are experiencing, this era of joy, isn't some shallow attempt to to ignore the problems of our world. Girls, women, non-binary people, queers, the people who have been denied joy the most are collectively reclaiming it and spreading it without caring what anybody else thinks, maybe for the first time. We are arming ourselves in pink, sprinkling ourselves with glitter, donning ourselves in feather boas, and stepping into a world that has always told us to be ashamed of everything that makes us happy. The author asks, Do you understand how courageous that is? This summer felt incredible to many, specifically, specifically because of the trauma that our country has endured since 2020. Violence, the pandemic, economic woes, climate anxiety, political turmoil, anti-Semitism, and the list goes on and on and on. To release these troubles for even a few hours with masses of others was a great catharsis. This is why Barbie was the most popular film of the year and Warner Brothers' highest grossing film ever. 
Joy is not only a reaction to pain. Actually, joy and pain are linked. Joy is part of the bevy of human experiences that includes both the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows. Joy feels good because it helps us to recognize our humanity. Rabbi Alan Liu, in his seminal book on the High Holidays, This is Real and You Are Completely Unprepared, explains, joy is a deep release of the soul, and it includes both, de both death and pain. Joy is any feeling fully felt, any experience we give our whole being to. We are conditioned to choose pleasure over pain, to reject pain, but the truth is, any moment of our lives fully inhabited, any feeling fully felt, any immersion in the full depth of life can be a source of deep joy. Judaism knows this. Although Jewish history has been pierced by tragedy, Jews have never lost their capacity to rejoice in the heart of darkness or to reach out toward God in ingenious ways while in exile. We know that pain is inevitable. We also know that through joy, we can survive and perhaps even thrive. No time exemplifies this mindset better than the days of awe. As we welcome Rosh Hashanah tonight, we begin the trying work of teshuva, of repentance, of returning to our highest selves and to the souls of others. It's not fun. It's uncomfortable to admit that we have made mistakes during this past year and we need to do better. And then next week, we'll gather again, this time for Yom Kippur. Did you know that our ancestors actually envisioned Yom Kippur to be a dress rehearsal for death? On Yom Kippur, we deny ourselves worldly pleasures like food and drink and intimacy or leather clothing. We recite vidui, the deathbed confession of sins. We cry out, who shall live but who shall die? Observant Jews even dress in kittels or white bur burial shrouds on Yom Kippur. Once we have endured both the exhaust of Rosh Hashanah and the discomfort of Yom, of Yom Kippur, we arrive at the ultimate holiday of joy, Sukkot. Another name for Sukkot is actually Zman Simchatenu, the time of our joy. We've thought about the inescapable reality that we are all imperfect and we're all dying. But now, we also realize that we're not dead yet. As Rabbi Angela Bookdahl preached a few years ago, we get another chance, not just to live, but to live better. Facing death urges us to heal our relationships, to make amends, to be more grateful, to live the life we truly want to live. The unsettling nature of this season presents us with a profound gift, the gift of realization. The realization that the time is now to restart, to repent, and to repair. Enjoy this gift. This Sukkot, sit in the sukkah. Notice the fragility of nature. Enjoy time with your loved ones. Enjoy being alive. Joy is also the recognition that we are a part of something greater than ourselves. I already mentioned that attending the Taylor Swift concert brought me great joy this past summer. In planning my outfit, making friendship bracelets to exchange at the concert, following the tour on social media for months, and then finally getting to experience it in a stadium of 70,000 others, I sensed that I was participating in a watershed moment for American pop culture. There's a name for this sense of belonging to something greater than yourself through a shared experience. Collective effervescence. Collective effervescence is a term coined in 1912 by French sociologist Emile Durkheim. It, it is the shared energy and harmony that occurs when people come together 
for a unified purpose. It explains the magic I have felt in being part of the Taylor Swift phenomenon, but it also explains the power of religious ceremonies like tonight. Collective effervescence leaves us feeling small against the vastness of humanity's place in the universe. Don't get me wrong, though. An experience does not have to take place in a large group in order to make us aware of something greater. While laughing with what loved ones, we become aware of the abundant love that surrounds us. When watching our pets play, we feel perhaps grateful to exist alongside such magnificent creatures as animals. Joy occurs when feeling awestruck by nature, exchanging knowing glances with a stranger, viewing art, savoring delicious food, and in a million other little ways. It relies on the recognition that there is more to the universe than whatever troubles you at any given moment. Finally, it's important that we seek joy because joy is contagious. Research shows that cultivating joy in our own lives benefits not only ourselves, but it actually benefits everybody around us. I recently read The Book of Joy, Lasting Happiness in a Changing World. Its authors, the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu, are no strangers to the world-changing power of joy. They write, survey after survey has shown that it is unhappy people who tend to be most self-focused and are socially withdrawn, brooding, and even antagonistic. Happy people, in contrast, are generally found to be more sociable, flexible, creative, and they're able to tolerate life's daily frustrations. And most important, they're also found to be more loving and forgiving than unhappy people. And they continue, still, some might wonder what our own joy has to do with countering injustice and inequality. What does our happy, un, happiness or unhappiness have to do with addressing the suffering of our world? In short, the more we heal our own pain, the more capacity we have to turn toward the pain of others. What would it look like for all of us to embrace more joy? First off, it would not mean ignoring pain. Instead, it would look like each of us squeezing pockets of time into our lives that make us feel inspired and grateful and strong so that we build a joyful life and the resiliency to face our problems and the problems of our world. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, the founder of Hasidic Judaism, wrote, if you don't feel happy, it's okay, it's okay, pretend to be. Even if you are downright depressed, put on a smile, act happy, genuine joy will follow. Get into the habit of singing a tune, it will give you new life and it will fill you with joy. Get into the habit of dancing. It will displace depression and dispel hardship. Always remember, joy is not merely incidental to your spiritual quest. It is vital. When I listen to my favorite song, for example, it doesn't matter how I was feeling before. After I listen, I feel invincible. What are the things that make you feel like that? Do more of them. Second, it's imperative that we all find ways to connect with something greater than our, ourselves, perhaps through Judaism. At the start of tonight's service, we heard the first shofar blast of this new Jewish year. As its call pierced our ears and pierced this holy space, we all committed to a meaningful high holiday season of reflection and repentance, and we all committed to being our highest selves in the year ahead. None of you, by nature of being here, even those online with us, you do not stand alone in these commitments. You stand with the hundreds of others who are here, those who are online, and the millions of other Jews who are also hearing the shofar tonight. Jewish traditions like this can make you feel small in the face of the universe's vastness. They can make you aware of divine presence, 
and they can make you feel like you belong. Ultimately, the impact of each of us sprinkling more joy into our lives would be monumental. When we have greater joy, we have greater capacity to be kind toward others. And when we're treated with kindness, we feel good and the chain continues. It's very simple. As we enter into the new Jewish year, I implore you to commit to joy over these next 12 months. Notice and relish joy when it bubbles up inside of you. By giving yourself this gift, you will at least make your, make your life more fun, but I would venture to say you will also infuse your life with more meaning too. The world needs your joy. So in the year 5784, why not embrace it? Shana Tovah.